So I welcome aboard this uh, table here. Uh, next to me, Mark Spieler. So Mark Spieler is a uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Antwerp with a focus on uh, resource recovery from wastewater, phosphorus, and nitrogen. So he's been assessing all our initiatives and uh, products or prototypes. And actually, over the last few days, we've defined some of these prototypes to become real products. And so information on those will follow imminently. But he's here now to guide us through some of the procedures, processes, and results from our life cycles. Thank you, Mark. Indeed. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, so we had this already. It's about the life cycle assessment of multifunctional fertilizers that we produce here in Sussford. I will also repeat to you what we mean by uh, multi multifunctionality of fertilizers and which aspects these are. Um, that's right here. So this includes the slow release properties, the coatings uh, that we that we have in that we've seen also in the, the previous presentations, the biosimilant, what I will call probiotics in the following, and the agrobiogels that, for instance, increase the water holding capacity that you have also, also seen uh, by Gibson, and of course the struvite and the sidrophores that we also had uh, touched upon. These are, when we combine all of those, we get our various kits, our different products, our six products. And uh, I will look in the following at the individual products together, their individual impacts that they have on the environment. I will mainly look at CO2 or exclusively look at CO2 emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions, although LCAs are, of course, much broader than this, including different impact categories. But that would maybe lead too far today, so we'll make it relatively simple for you uh, to follow. Uh, so indeed here, as already stated, the objective is to evaluate the environmental impact of these uh, multifunctional fertilizers. Um, and the question whether are whether these fertilizers reduce impacts compared to conventional market alternatives. Uh, and today only the CO2. Um, a little bit of how the following results will be looking like. So on the left-hand side, you see our uh, innovations, the multifunctional fertilizers that we are having. And on the right-hand side here, this picture should signify the conventional alternatives like an SSP, for instance. So as we are producing our novel Susford innovative fertilizers, we're of course replacing coatings, replacing other biostimulants um, or SSP, for instance, in trials. And this is then an avoided product, hence this nicely crossed out uh, X here. To then calculate CO2 emission impact, uh, we need to apply a simplified calculation as you see down here. We arrive at the net impact, at the balanced impact of the suspect innovation minus the business as usual, the BAU, as you will see in the following slides. Um, which is basically the cross that you see here on top. So there's a little bit of context for you to follow the following results and interpret alongside with me what you're going to see. And that's a little bit looking like this. So we start uh, with the coatings and their respective environmental impact. Um, so here on top, on the top right corner, you see uh, the calculation that is carried out that I just explained. Um, and here, the first time you see this graphic now, uh, you see like a very simplified bar chart. What do you see in this bar chart? You see uh, the zero points, uh, which is an uh, important one, because everything up with a positive sign means it has an impact. So this blue bar is uh, the lignosulfonate coating uh, using uh, glycerol. Uh, in this case, um, as a plasticizer, and they have an impact here, just in relative terms as percentage. I'm not going into the exact CO2 emissions that will be part of this. Um, you see that here, so upwards means an impact, they emit CO2, but as we replace polyethylene, so coatings, alternative coatings are some sorts of plastics, different types of polyethylene, polyethylene, uh, um, or also some uh, oils that are hydrocarbon based could be used as coatings, but we avoid those coatings in the process. And so we get, in, strangely enough, a negative impact. Of course, we are avoiding something so we can subtract this 
here as shown up here. So we get, we balance these two impacts and we get then this little dash, the net impact, which is negative, which is actually good. We could make a smiley here. So the conclusion, the first one you can see from this uh, presentation here is that the, the lignosulfonates um, have a negative impact when you produce them one kilo of them as compared to one kilogram of polyurethane. Uh, and that is about 1.5 uh, kilogram CO2 saved per kilogram of these lignosulfonates produced. If you then want to know more specifically where are these impacts coming from in this very dark blue bar, so informing, for instance, SAPI, who's producing these coatings, how can they improve their processes? We can drill into these uh, processes and we can see that, for instance, the plasticizers make a sizable impact here, that electricity plays a role, but also the enzyme that is used in the process plays a role in generating this impact. So SAPI can then go ahead and optimize together with us finding alternative uh, energy supplies, uh, finding alternative plasticizers, and determining the best, uh, the least impactful uh, com combinations, compositions of their process. Um, we did the same for the probiotics. As I said in the beginning, we took a slightly different approach here for the probiotics. Um, we asked the question, how much probiotics or how much phosphorus fertilizer would need to be saved to achieve a zero burden uh, in terms of CO2 approach for uh, produce production of uh, probiotics. And um, the answer is in, firstly in the, in the left-hand slide. So you see the dried uh, probiotics have 100% impact on top. And if we save 9.28 uh, kilograms of phosphate rock, uh, then we have a zero CO2 emissions uh, balance. And that equates to about 3% savings of P demand when you take a 90, a 90 kilogram uh, P205 application in, uh, in a conventional maize field. Um, and then you can, we can ask further the question, probiotics, well, where are those impacts coming from? And you see that in the processing, in the fermentation process, they're using uh, the electricity plays a role, uh, natural gas plays a role to uh, sanitize the, uh, the reactor, uh, to clean it basically, and to and also glucose as a feedstock plays a role. So we can again see whether we can change the feedstock and further reduce the, the impact. This is a substantial uh, impact here, although whether we could recover energy in some way. Um, the agrobiodales, this uh, amazing agrobiodales, uh, you see, nothing happens. Uh, so what's their impact? And these agrobiogels are, in our assessment, as amazing as they are here today. Um, because they have an amazing property, they are saving, they can save you drink uh, irrigation water application. And uh, if you were to irrigate your crops, this has a large impact, uh, of course, in terms of pumping, um, in terms of abstraction of the water that has also impacts in other categories of LCAs. But our results show if we take conventional irrigation in uh, Austria uh, of maize fields that we can really reduce our CO2 emissions quite a lot uh, by this negative bar signified here, um, almost 500 kilograms CO2 equivalent uh, ton dry matter of, of lignosulfonates. Uh, but also to Gibson, he can further improve his process by, for instance, improving his electricity demand uh, and reducing this further or using renewable electricity uh, or reducing this gas consumption. Chemicals play a smaller role in this uh, process. Um, struvite, uh, we assessed also the struvite uh, that's sourced from uh, wastewater installations, for instance, as we have seen it before. Also struvite, we see a similar pattern as in all our previous uh, partial products. We see that this dot here is on the negative side we can avoid uh, more than 100% of the impact. That is, means the negative bar is twice uh, this uh, red bar going up. How do we save these impacts? How do we uh, generate a negative impact in this case? Well, some of this impact is derived from uh, avoiding the production of single superphosphates. Uh, that emits also CO2, of course. But also a large part is the avoidance of iron free, free chloride in the wastewater treatment itself. And in this wastewater treatment, iron is used as a precipitant for phosphorus that is dissolved in the wastewater. So 
for the wastewater companies, sous-vide production is actually a way of removing phosphorus from the, the effluent and therefore meeting environmental norms. So, but they can save this, and this brings us here to savings. But also sous-vide production itself, uh, the precipitation of sous-vide in the reactor can be further improved to do, uh, and here electri electricity plays a role, but also uh, the, the base uh, dosage uh, can be further improved potentially. In some cases, there's no basis dose, base dose, in fact, and, and when you produce uh, struvites, but also the magnesium chloride or sulfate uh, that is necessary to pr uh, provide the, uh, the magnesium ions uh, is, can be further improved uh, potentially. Um, then we look at the, the civil force. Uh, also here, you see the negative impact. Um, how does this coming from? The civil force are functionally equivalent uh, to EDTAs. Um, we are working on improving the exact equivalence, but if we were to replace EDTAs, we can see that we can also avoid again CO2 emissions. The bar is negative and our dash it's in the minus 60% area. So also here we can save significant amounts of CO2 uh, and we can further improve the process of uh, producing sidereal force by ASIAS, uh, for instance, by improving electricity uh, demand. If we further upscale, this would naturally be happening, naturally not, but it's usually the case when you upscale, you get uh, more uh, efficient glucose. The feedstock doesn't play such a big role in our impact. So focus should here be on electricity. Uh, finally, we can combine our products together uh, in these different mixing ratios and formulation ratios that we are using here. Um, on the left-hand side, we see uh, one of our SAS kits that is the combination of struvite, lignosulfonate, and probiotics. And here we see that especially the struvite plays a, little, a, a large role in avoiding impacts. Here you see it then in actually CO2 equivalents. Um, so more than uh, three kilograms of CO2 can be avoided per kilogram of our fertilizer produced. And um, we also see that uh, the lignosulfonates play a small role, while the probiotics, the way they are modeled at the moment, it's not shown here because we modeled the net zero uh, point. So we avoid CO2 emissions here. Um, the same applies to another suskit, which is composed of agrobiogenes and probiotics. Also here, we mainly due to the uh, Agrobiogenes, we've seen their magnific magnificent impact earlier. We can avoid about two, two and a half uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of uh, um, product. So that is uh, quite good. And yeah, here's also the assumption for the probiotics. So overall, our fertilizers, well, that's my next slide. All, all, overall, our fertilizers that we produce in these compositions that I've just shown you, they avoid CO2 emissions. They are not just CO2 neutral, but indeed they are reducing uh, CO2 emissions when compared to the current market alternatives. Uh, and I think a very important takeaway is also to work on electric energy to improve further our uh, electric energy consumption. We are contributing with this project also to the agenda of electrifying uh, our economy further and uh, going away from fossil fuels. Uh, and as our process has shown, lots of impacts and lots of use comes from electricity. We first of all electri electrify it, but we have potential to further reduce this by reducing re using renewable energies, for instance. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you and close here.